Welcome back to Light the Fuse. And boy, do we have a special one today, don't we, Charles? Yes, we do. This was a joy to talk to Eric Gendrison. If you recall, he was on our 200th episode, but he didn't speak too much. We had, we had, we had a lot of people on the 200th episode. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, he made his presence known, but he wasn't, you didn't hear a lot from him. So I'm very glad that we got to have this one-on-one time with him. Yeah, and, you know, it looks like right now he's going to be, there's no official credit, obviously, Writers Guild credits are a thing that happens down the line, but it seems like he's going to be credited as co-writer of Dead Reckoning Part 2, maybe Part 1, but he's also been around, he's been a sounding board for Christopher McQuarrie since Ghost Protocol. Yes, and they've worked together before in various capacities before that as well. Yes, which you will find out some fascinating projects that they've they've worked on before. Um, that he's worked on, that McHugh's, whatever, you know, and uh, it's great. So I'm, I'm just really excited that there's not really spoilers for the new Mission Impossible movies because he wouldn't tell us anything, obviously, right? I mean, no, there's not really. I mean, I think at one point he talks about a setting that you see in the trailer and tells like a funny on set story, but there's no spoiler at all about it. Um, there's like a sort of a he says like where that section takes place in the chronological order of the movie, but it's really not, it's not a spoiler at all. So that's just wanted to give that heads up. If, if you're, I mean, obviously, if you're doing a blackout with Mission Impossible so that you're nothing, you don't want to know anything, I guess you'd want to skip that part, I guess. But it's really not, uh, there's nothing, there's no spoil. He, he, we, we tried to get spoilers out of him. <laughs> He's a stonewall. You know, between him and McCory, we really have cornered the market on these kind of like sage, masculine, but poetic writers. And, you know, I yeah. listening to this, you will see why they get along so well. But he oh, yeah. he also maintains McCory's level of elliptical, enigmatic, kind of <laughs> not giving us any answers as hard as we try style. So, yeah. yeah. I think we're pretty respectful about it, too. We're just, you know, we're trying to get to the process and find out what his relationship with McCory has been. And it's a, it's a fascinating talk. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for people to hear it. I loved this chat. I thought this was maybe one of our best, and I can't wait to talk to him again after Seven comes out. He was very gracious with his time, and so we thank him for that, because this is a two-parter. We got to say that. Two part, this is part one. So yeah, get ready. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, before we get into it, let me just do my favorite part of the show. Charles, can you can you give me that pleasure? I I would, yes, I'd be glad to give you that pleasure, okay. please. Okay. It would be my pleasure, too. Well, this episode is once again brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and his podcast, My Favorite Album. And of course, we encourage you to go over there and check out his podcast. And not just the episodes that we are on, but we are on a few, so check those out, too. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by John B., uh, the great Elvis Ripley, and of course, Suchet, who we got to meet on our monthly Zoom chat and... We encourage everyone to get to that level so you can be on that Zoom chat because that is a lot of fun. Yeah, it's awesome. A lot of fun. So I guess we can get into it. Let's get into it and then we'll be back afterwards. We are so excited to be joined by Eric Genderson. Now, do you want to tell us kind of what your role is on these next two movies and what maybe about your relationship with McQuarrie, just to kind of establish that? Right. Well, I mean, shouldn't we we should start with Rogue Nation and Dead Reckoning Part Two for the hair thing. Okay. That's just for the hair thing. I just wanted to get it out of the way. Okay. Those, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's Rogue Nation Rogue and Nation Dead Reckoning and part Dead Reckoning two. part. So you're a short hair guy and a bit of a long hair guy. Well, no, I mean they're kind of similar in those two. Rogue Rogue Nation is he's it's kind of middle, medium, medium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and similar in okay. uh, in Dead Reckoning part two. Macquarie and I go back a long ways. We we met, um, I don't know, eighteen, maybe twenty years ago at. Um, the Sundance Screenwriters Lab in in Utah. We were both advisors at the lab. Um, and I, I actually think that was the lab where Kerry Fukunaga was a, a, a fellow, <laughs> actually. Um, but we met at the lab and and we sort of hit it off like Damon and Pythias. And uh, then subsequently we, I had, I gave him a script 
of mine that I was anxious for him to put his eyes on. Um, this was the period of time that he would refer to as when he was in movie jail. Right. And I said, you know, if you ever want to get back in the saddle, here's here's something. And it was a, a screenplay about Antoine de saint exupéry the, the French aviator and the author of The Little Prince. And um, it's actually, curiously enough, it's the, it's the script that ended up getting me Band of Brothers as well. But I gave him the script to read and he got really excited about it and sort of uh, gladly attached himself to the project. And then we decided, then we ended up doing a, uh, a project for AMC. We did a, uh, the, the notion was to do a, a television series uh, of The Conversation that commences one year to the day after the events of the film, after of Coppola's film. Wow. Yeah, and it's it was an amazing pilot and uh, and uh, treatment for the for the season, but it was a classic regime change thing. Christina Wayans at AMC. I think it was the week we delivered the the pilot. She quit, and I mean that regime change thing is you know that that's got a, it's had a lot of victims because um, the slate gets sort of wiped clean and a project dies. Listen, Eric. Before you continue, I just want to say it would be a real tragedy if that. Um script somehow found its way into our inbox and i mean who's to say where it came from or you know its origin or anything i'm just gonna say that you know that would be just tragic i just want to that would be tragic and i'm all about tragedy (laughs) i support tragedy in every (laughs) every every way possible um yes let's see if we can if we can maybe make something tragic happen in any case yeah um (laughs) that was sort of the beginning of the whole thing and um, we, I guess we kind of found in each other um, a tremendous sense of com- camaraderie and, and friendship and trust. And our tastes were sort of similar. We find, found fairly early on that we kind of complemented each other in a lot of ways in what we brought to the, to the table from a storytelling standpoint. And then subsequently, we've done a, and developed a lot of stuff together. We've got a lot of stuff that's in the, in the pipeline right now, in fact. And with regard to mission, I uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I had written a. Um, we had collaborated on a script that was, um, <laughs> well, it's it will now be known as the Gnarly Project, but it was being. <laughs> yes, it was we, being, we know all about. No, we don't know all about. We no, wish don't. we knew all about the Gnarly Project. All we know is that it's gnarly, and it's Tom <laughs> Cruise and it's McQuarrie. It is genuinely gnarly, and the funny thing was that originally it was being developed for. Uh, we were on it sort of writing and producing and, and uh, another director was, it was his project and another actor and they fell out of it because this director went out to do something else that was pretty silly. And so we're, I was sitting here with this script and it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And one day Chris and I were talking about just sort of next with Tom. And I said, hold on a second. And I sort of looked into my research because it's part of the story is based on real events and, and not real people so much as a real type of person who was involved in something that happened historically. And I looked into all my research and I determined that there were there were like five guys who were exactly Tom's age who did this. I said, wait, wait a minute, what about, we should show this to Tom. So we did. And we ended up spending about three days on Zoom reading it out loud to each other uh, or together and he um, attached himself like a limpet to the project. And, uh, and that's how we really kind of got to know each, he and I got to know each other face to face. I had been for years, sort of just the voice on the other end of the phone with, with McHugh, you know, breaking story and figuring things out with, with Rogue and with, uh, and with Fallout. So it, you know, it's, it's like Mission itself. This thing that distinguishes the franchise is friendship. And my so my connection to this whole thing really begins and ends in in friendship. And then with uh, with all the stuff that was happening with the pandemic and scheduling and everything, they uh, Tom and Chris decided they wanted to bring me on formally to help finish seven and then co-script eight with Chris. And what what is what was that like in ter- in terms of uh, the daunting uh, aspect of that because these are beasts yeah they're beasts i mean we've all you probably you probably heard him say it's sort of like designing an airplane and then getting a bunch of sheet metal and nuts and bolts and throwing them over the edge of a cliff and building the airplane on the way down 
it's and it's very meta you know uh breaking story and crafting these things and then being in the midst of them and and every emergency every problem creates another opportunity it's it completely different muscles are required as a storyteller it's the anti stundance approach <laughs> to storytelling in a lot of ways <laughs> right <laughs> and it's very you have to really think on your feet and you know, have multiple solutions. I mean, as a storyteller, as a screenwriter of these things, you sort of are, you have to be Ethan Hunt, um, not embodying the character. You have to play that role, always have an answer, always maybe know where to go next or have, you know, different options. Um, because it is a, it's a, it's a, it is a beast. It's a big, gnarly, wonderful beast. That's, it's a live, it's like a living thing. You have to be able to move with. It. Well, you, you've written sort of big, franchise things but you had a star trek script uh at one point yeah that predate is that, that predated the jj oh, yeah. version yeah it did okay <laughs> <laughs> what what was that and and i guess sort of i guess what was that experience like compared to actually you know making these that was a really weird experience because i went into it unwillingly they had approached me the uh who were that the producers i can't remember brandon and carrie and this whole bunch of guys who you know sort of had their arms around the franchise at this time and they'd approached me through my agent and said would you be interested in having a meeting about you know doing a star trek prequel and i said no i'm, I'm not I, i'm not i don't i'm not really a i'm not a science fiction fan except for the classics and Vern and wells that type of thing and uh, so I, I refused. And then they came back to me again. And they, for some reason, they said, could, would you really come? Could you talk, just have a conversation with this? I'm really not interested, guys. And then a third time, I finally said, fine, let's let, let's talk about it. And I got on the phone with them. And I said, look, I don't I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the franchise. I said, what I love about it is two things. I love the character of, of James T. Kirk, this sort of Horatio Hornblower-esque guy and i love the fact that the television series was always relevant it was socially and politically relevant the stories that were being told were you know an analogs to social issues and political issues and it was unique in that way i said that really interests me well what would you do i said well what i would I'd probably do is i do a trilogy and i base the first one on the iliad and sort of base the second one on the odyssey and i don't have no fucking idea what the third one would be <laughs> but and they said would you think about it a little bit i said sure so I gave it some thought and I came back to them and I, I pitched them an idea and they liked it and they wanted me to come down to Paramount and to pitch it uh, to the head of the studio at the time. And so we all went into this meeting. It was the strangest meeting I've ever had. They warned me ahead of time that he never bought anything in the room. And I didn't have anything to lose because I didn't really want to write this, you know. And I sat down, there was a whole row of producers sitting at one sofa and the head of the studio and i and i started by saying i don't really like science fiction <laughs> that really endears yourself eric in it, the room. exactly you know, it really and, sets the tone well i mean i think at least he knew he could trust me and i i proceeded to start to to pitch this story and i got to a point and there was just utter it was like being in a sensory deprivation tank there was no sensation no sound in the room it was just dead <laughs> and I looked over at the sofa and one of the producers, and I don't know to this day why he was doing it. He was doing the Kennedy when he just got shot thing, you know, with his fists under his chin and his elbows up. And I, it was just the strangest thing in the world. So I thought, okay. So I just continued to tell the story. I told it all the way to the end and I finished it. I said, that's, that's the end. Dead silence. And the, the head of the studio said, uh, how fast could you write this? I said, I have it for you on Tuesday. I said, no, seriously, it was uh, about, I don't know, eight weeks. He stuck his hand out and he couldn't write it fast. And so we all walked out and they were like, hey, you're, you're writing the next Star Trek movie. I said, oh, fuck. great. <laughs> okay. So I went home and I decided I'd approach it like I'm a, my thing with, as, a, as a kid, my whole thing was, was Sherlock Holmes and that canon. And so I, I sort of approached it with a huge sense of responsibility to the camp. Uh, not fan service, but responsibility. It, it was sort of like, I'm telling the story, if, if the canon was an encyclopedia, I'm telling the, the missing pieces were like F to, and G, right? Mm -hmm. And because it takes place after Enterprise and in this particular place. And this is about the Earth-Romulan War, the one part of the 
story that had never really been told. It started the whole, you know, legacy of Star Trek. So I did. So I went uh, deep dived. It's deep research, and and wrote a hell of a script. And I delivered it on a Monday. And that Tuesday, the head of the studio was fired. <laughs> Again, regime change, and that's why he said write it fast because <laughs> he knew this was going to happen. And I wasn't late with the thing, but it it, it died on the plan. But Joe Blow dot com got a hold of a script and they did a complete write up of the entire movie and put it online and so it's ended up on memory alpha as as an actual part of the can even though it was never made wow <laughs> yeah. no it was it was silly um yeah and the wga actually st- tried to delay jj's film release because i hadn't been listed as a contributing writer and which was really weird. And I had to call the WGA off of them and explain, look, my, my story takes place in a completely different century than this does and has nothing to do with, with what JJ was trying to do. So wow. that was all, that was its own. Art. Did that Star Trek have a title? Was it just going to be the new Star Trek or was it going to have? It was called Star Trek The Beginning. Oh. How inventive is that? <laughs> it's got a ring to it yeah it's got a ring well do you want to take us through like maybe movie by movie and just talk about kind of what you're what you helped out with what you kind of cracked in, in each one not really i mean it's again this okay. is <laughs> it's be, i mean you got to take into consideration the fact that you know chris and i are are, are really dear friends and have, are working on a lot of stuff together and i mean i think for each other mutually we rely on each other to you know bounce things off of each other's foreheads uh no matter what we're doing whether it's something we're doing together or 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 individually and so in in the course of i sort of lived through actually even part of ghost protocol and rogue and fallout vicariously you know with not daily phone calls but every you know a few times a week there would be a a long session talk about what he was shooting on what problems he was encountering and we just you know talk it out and it was it's just sort of that uh mission storytelling therapy session well maybe is there is there something that he called you with that you weren't sure you were going to figure out how to fix oh always okay <laughs> i mean i mean the the problems when they're when they land in your lab when they're presented they do in fact seem impossible I mean, you know, how the hell are we going to get around this? And there are all the reasons why this shouldn't work. And and then just what about this and what about this? And it's amazing. I think Chris has probably talked about this before, how things that are ideas that were abandoned a long time ago will somehow manage to circle back. And it's a matter of sort of keeping track of all that stuff, and you know, being able to recall, hey, wait a minute, what about, what if, you know, and uh, though... I, I can definitely say that for um, Dead Reckoning one and two, there, there's there there are no vestigial pieces from other things really. It, it's just a fresh, full bore, uh, massive story. Okay. And is this is I mean, it sounds like your situation is slightly different on these two because you're going to have credit. I have no idea what uh, I mean with oh, okay. regard. I, mean, yeah, I guess on 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 eight certainly with regard to seven. I I don't know. It's up to it's up to Tom and and Chris. But has the experience been different for you in terms of being so entrenched in these two to a degree that maybe you weren't in the others? Oh, certainly because it's a okay. formal uh, you know uh, arrangement. I mean, they really pulled me in to work on this, and it's been it's been two years of uh, and it's been nonstop. I mean, every day solving problems, doing different drafts of things, trying things out. I went to Abu Dhabi for stuff on seven and I was there this summer uh, shooting stuff for, we were shooting stuff for eight and, and seven and eight in London uh, this summer. Uh, so, and just being involved sort of on the floor and on the day uh, has been important. And there, I'll be going back to another location probably in, maybe at the end of February and March as well. A location that I can't reveal. No, but you might want to pack warm, we understand, for that one. You betcha. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I've been yeah. watching episodes of Alone. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, can you recall, like, going back to, I mean, I can't believe it actually goes back to Ghost Protocol. McCory was on that. He came on as a writer um, in the middle of the of the process. And I know that he was reviewing footage and then... P 
piecing together a new draft of that script. Right. So do you remember like what was the first like he did he call you and does he call you with like a story problem? Like he's like, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to get this person to get to here or what what are those or like how to connect this set piece to that set piece. Like, do you recall what it was specifically for Ghost Protocol? I think with Ghost Protocol, it was the whole upstairs downstairs thing. And frequently, what it will be with with him and all and with all those films is that, you know, he'll call me up and and start explaining what the problem is and start talking it out. And just the process of talking it out, he tells, you know. So it's not like I'm coming in with it. Oh, this is the solution to this, and we just do it this way. So right. we just have a we have a very very intense dialogue and, and we laugh a lot and we come up with you know we just enjoy it so much it's a real passion storytelling for both of us and the, you know the the requisites of of mission are different from any other franchise any other kind of storytelling any other kind of movie making there 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 are some rules and it's it, like i said before you're exercising completely different muscles and that's really challenging i mean the 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 impossibility sheer impossibility of doing another Mission Impossible movie after nothing was left on the table before is itself just a tonic for both of us, I think, it's rocket fuel. You know, you can't do this. Yes, we do. And you're doing it now, right? Yeah. This minute, yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you talk, we love, obviously love our stories about our now, our good friend Tom Cruise. So <laughs> if you can just talk about, because he is the other kind of like brain in you this bet. kind of hive mind, right? So. Yeah. Can you can you talk about working with him and sort of what he brings to the the storytelling process? Yeah, he brings something supernatural to it. That is the only way I can explain it. And the first time I got a, I mean, a personal experience of this was when we were doing those three days of Zoom calls and on that other script. And Tom would start would ask a question about something that I did, I wouldn't really understand. Wait, why is that a why do you have a problem with that? And he was, you'd be hung up on something and he's a dog with a bone. He gets on something and he, and, and it didn't make any sense to me what he was talking about. And ultimately when I finally realized what was behind his concern, it was just like an epiphany and he was right. And I give, I actually give him a lot of shit about it because it, Tom being right annoys the shit out of him. And he's <laughs> right like 98% of the time. What's really galling about it is when it begins, the thing that he latches onto, the thing that he he's concerned about or doesn't understand is such a head scratcher. Why don't you understand this? What is it? And then ultimately, oh, fuck, yeah, no, you're right. And I mean, it's it's quite magical, quite alchemical. And it really is for these two movies. Yeah, it's been the three of us uh, are breaking story, cracking things. You know, I'll come up with something. Chris come up, comes up with something. Tom has an idea. We mull it around, we craft something that all thrilled with, and then on the day, no, let's, let's do something else. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll change at the last minute, you know. Well, how, how does that make you feel? That uh, you, you really surrender yourself to it, and you start to really enjoy the challenge of it, knowing that this is a movable feast. This is something that is it's it's fungible. It's constantly evolving right before your eyes, and you, and it's. It's very stimulating to, to sort of be on your toes that way as a as a storyteller. Okay. Your your normal. I, I'd be curious to know what your normal writing process is when when you're completely by yourself writing your own thing, in terms of like outline. No. Do you use an outline or anything no. like that? Do you use note cards or anything like no. that? No. Do you just you just jump right into a script when you have an idea? You just kind of put it on the page. Yeah, I think for me it's um, I I think about it while I'm doing other things until I know what the opening frame is. When I know what the first image of the story is. So are you kind of, do you kind of hold the whole, do you sort of hold the general story in your head, like a three act type thing in your head, and then you find the opening image and then jump in? Never three acts. I always just, I, I kind of hold the whole thing in an amorphous way in my head. I'll generally know where something is gonna end, more or less. But the real key for me is that, is the ignitions, the spark, which is that opening, shot what is how does the story begin right and then it's about serving the story and i generally write chronologically from just beginning to end and allow this allow the story and the characters to help guide me it's a dance you know anytime you try to force anything on a story you're you're screwing yourself and then ultimately and then once i get to the end 
generally you, you can look back at it and say, well, look, it falls into exactly three acts and it did it all by itself. I think if you try to do that act by act, it's there's something kind of phony about it and that I just don't believe in. I don't de- generally believe necessarily in the universality of the three act structure anyway. But uh, it's it when you finish something, a story, and it, it's, it is somewhat of an endorsement of the structure when you can look at it and say, wow, it really is three acts and they're classic three acts, you know? Yeah. But I let it happen organically. You have a favorite program? What do you write? What do you write in? Final draft. Okay. Sorry, John August. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, John. (laughs) I think he was at that lab too, actually. If I'm not mistaken. Chris and I met. Yeah. And it's, you know, and then there's the, the Trey Parker rule which I only learned recently it is so wonderful and that to apply to your writing. You guys know about this? No. Is this the, um, the therefore or because? The therefore, the, the but and therefore thing. And I've added to it, I've added a meanwhile to it. Well, here, so for, for people who don't know, explain the Trey Parker rule first and then, and then tell us what you added. It's the idea that, you know, story is a series of, of films, a series of scenes, right? And if you can interrogate your script and say, if you, if, you, if you can say the word in between the scenes, but, or therefore, or meanwhile, then it's an engine. It's, it's, it's moving itself forward. There's a reason for everything to be connected or to be in that sequence. If you say, and then you're screwed, because then it's just, okay, there's this scene, and then there's this scene, and then there's this scene when a story really has life and has emotional relevance, it's something that is moving because, but therefore, meanwhile, you know, so it really, it's a, it's a great little test. Yeah. There's a, there's a cause and effect chain. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. If, and it feels alive. So wait, what now, what did you add to it? I added meanwhile. Meanwhile. Okay. You know, the, you said there's no vestigial parts from other mission movies, but McCory has talked pretty openly about how this movie will have a bunch of stuff from other scripts that he didn't get to make. Yeah. And I know you, you've had a lot of projects that maybe haven't moved forward in the ways that you wanted. Is there anything from those scripts of your own that you, you found a home in, uh, in these two movies? I suppose, I mean, in a similar way with Chris, I mean, it sort of, I I think he spoke in at the 200th episode about, you know, being able to make a submarine movie. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> which has always been a dream of both of ours. And, you know, we, with what we're doing in this story with regard to this, this thing, it's uh, we, we sort of get, got to make our submarine movie in a, in a very concentrated way. There are, there are aspects of the story. There are settings of the story. There are, there are, there are, there are certainly sequences that it's just wish fulfillment from a filmmaking storytelling standpoint. Wouldn't it be great if we could write, you know, make a movie in which there was, you know, we could have a just tracking John Ford shot of, you know, Bedouin mercenaries racing across a desert. Shoot. Yeah, we got that. <laughs> you know, it's very, a lot of classical stuff. There's a lot of amazing, amazing uh, sort of wish fulfillment moments in both of these films. Anything in particular, maybe that we've seen that, that you, that is a particular highlight for you. The, what you've seen in the trailer? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe from, you know, spy shots of airplanes r- racing around or whatever. right well i mean there's there's a classicism to this story that is sort of re- redolent of the origins of the spy genre in a lot of ways you know there are moments that feel sort of like if something from an eric ambler novel um going you know going way back to the origins of the of the genre very sort of analog tale and you know i mean look we've got look at the stuff in the trailer there's a attache case, a train, you know, real magic. Yes. And a, and a submarine. We're very excited about the close-up magic. Yeah. No, the, clo- the close-up magic is amazing. When I, when I first saw it, I, uh, and on the day, I just did, I couldn't even. I just, it, yeah, it's completely in camera. Is Tom Cruise like working with somebody for that? Or has he just been training on his own? Or how, how did, where did that like? Uh, he, he. Everything he everything he does, he throws himself into, you know, one hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's with this preternatural ability, he, he has to completely master something, yeah. which again is super annoying. 
<laughs> um, and, then, and then he is able to pull it off so effortlessly. I, I, I don't know how long he, he worked on that. But it was convincing on set. It was completely convincing. Yeah, for all I know, he actually, <laughs> he actually materialized the key out of, out of ether. <laughs> Amazing. And we're back. Oh, yeah. Man, there's some good stuff in here. Um, the TV show of The Conversation that they wrote, he and McCory together. I have not had... Uh, well, so can we say that we uh, <laughs> tracked it down? Or no. Yeah, I think we can say we maybe tracked <laughs> we were, it down. We, and maybe we'll we, do a Patreon we, on we, it we, at some we point. We might have tracked down a script uh, for that. Um, I don't, You know, I can't reveal how we got it, but... Uh, it, it, I, I just took a quick peek at it and it does, it's the continuing adventures of Harry Call, the, uh, you know, Gene Hackman's character. Um, and I can't wait to dig into what I assume is a legitimate screenplay, but we, we, you know, we, who knows if we actually got the real thing. We need to, we need to ask them who they thought of in the role. Oh, that's such a good question. Why didn't we ask him that? Well, we're both idiots, Charles, <laughs> is the reason, but we do have these people's cell phone information so we can text them yes and, ask and, them. and i think you're right we should do a patreon about it and yeah. when that time comes maybe we can get that information and we can put it into that patreon episode so there you go sign up for our patreon that's patreon.com slash light the fuse um he's also part of the gnarly project which we keep hearing about which is the christopher mccory um directed movie with tom cruise that you know, McCory keeps describing as gnarly. And and it was interesting to hear him say that it was originally for a different director and actor. Yeah. Uh, we need to know more about this. <laughs> yeah. um, he said the director, like, dropped off to do some silly project. Wow. Uh, that means a franchise movie, I'm sure. So now we've got to see every person who signed on to a Jurassic World or a uh, <laughs> a Marvel movie or something. Uh, but, Yeah. Pretty interesting. Every time they say gnarly, I always think about the line in Jack Reacher where Tom Cruise says he's going to drink the guy's blood out of a boot. Yeah. that's that To me, that is the epitome of the gnarly project. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume it's going to be some kind of dirty, hairy type thing. I, I don't know. I'm so excited. Uh, it was also cool to hear him talk. I, I, it was amazing because he has, you know all these amazing literary references that he's making throughout. And he's obviously very brilliant that way, much smarter than me. Um, I can barely read. Um, so <laughs> but um, I love that he, he like brought up the Trey Parker rule. Like I, you know that I'm a huge Trey Parker fan. Trey Parker and Matt Stone, I think are just absolutely incredible. Do you want to run that? I was actually thinking about this and I don't know if I quite understood it in the moment. Do you want to say what it is again right now? I think there's a, uh, it's actually, what is it called? There's a great documentary. I think that's where it came from or where it got popularized. That like eight days in hell or whatever. Yeah, it is. it's yeah. like eight days to air or something like that. I yeah. need to look up what it's called. But it's this, It's uh, I think it's pretty short too. It's a really great, if you can find it, seek out this documentary. It's about the making of the South Park episodes and how they, they put together their episodes in a week. You know, a lot of these animated shows when they get made. They write it, and then it goes off to an animation studio in another country, and they, they it's worked on for months and months, and then it comes back, and that's how they make their shows. And so the thing with South Park is that they are incredibly topical. Like, they can write things the week of a story breaking, a news story breaking, and they can write an episode in reaction to it that comes out the next week, because that's how quickly they make it. And so there's a documentary about the making of South Park. I think it's in that, but even if it's not, it's a great document to watch how Trey Parker and Matt Stone work and what their process is. And, and Trey Parker, I think, is a brilliant writer. And part of that process is uh, he talks about their credo or, you know, their belief in, in system and writing, um, their method. It's, it's, it's making sure that your cause and effect chain in what's happening in your episode is strong. And part of that is making sure that in between each scene, you, so like if you have scene a and scene b they're back to back in your script it's making sure that you can you have to say the word therefore in between them like so scene a happens therefore scene b happens okay and then the other version of that is but so like scene a happens but 
scene B happens. And then and that's and then also between scene B and scene C, same thing. Scene B happens, therefore scene C happens. And it's just a, a great way of looking at it to make sure that your your uh, script is very much has a strong cause effect chain so that it's not just and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens, which, you know, it's I mean, I'm sure it's I, I don't know what, you know, McCory and them use, but they're they're obviously very strong story trajectory with the their methodology and the way they write their stuff. And so it's making sure that it's relevant and uh, yeah, just a, it's like a strong backbone for your screenplay. Uh, so that, that's what they, anyway, that's what that is, the Trey Parker rule. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, also awesome to hear him talk about uh, close-up magic, uh, to see the close-up magic in, in person. You know, we're so excited about that. Um, cannot wait to see the close-up magic back in the Mission Impossible series. We've been waiting. Um, We've been waiting. I know. Patiently. <laughs> But uh, uh, come back. Uh, come back for part two. There's going to be so much more good stuff uh, you're going to want to hear about. And uh, we're going to get into... He's also, you know, the the head writer for Band of Brothers. He was like... He wrote the show Bible and wrote a, wrote a bunch of episodes of Band of Brothers, which is such a classic... I mean, uh, that was such a monumental TV series. And so to hear him talk about that. Um, also, we talk about other projects that he has worked on that you grill him about, like... What's the alien project that we get into next week? Oh, he did a Majestic 12 show, or he pitched one or whatever. So we, I wanted to know. I mean, he seems very, you know, research-driven. We wanted to know, are we alone? Yes. And he yeah. he lets us know. He says that he researched, because he did a lot of research for Band of Brothers, uh, and he said he did even more research for that project about Majestic 12. Yeah, and you're, so, so you're going to find, find out. out. So come back if you want to know yeah. whether or not we've yeah. been visited by aliens. Um, well, Charles, you already mentioned the Patreon. What else can people check out? Well, so everyone should go to our T Public page and get a shirt or a magnet. That's linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. And uh, also on our website, check out the uh, our show notes for all of our episodes in our episode guide, uh, which also has a tab there on our website. And yeah, just again, please sign up for our Patreon, patreon.com slash lightthefuse. And what else, Drew? Well, I just think people should follow us on social media at Light the Fuse Pod on Instagram and Twitter. We're still on Twitter. We're going to be there until the last day. It, it's becoming incredibly unpleasant <laughs> to use. And I have got so some, glitchy now. It's so glitchy. I see stuff from people that I've muted like 10 years ago <laughs> now. It's the ads are really bad. I saw yeah. I got an ad yesterday for some kind of like nightstick that you use to break out of a car if you're in a car crash. Yes. It's just I, I keep seeing the same ad over and over and over again. Yes, it's very strange. <sighs> it's very bad. But we're there now. We'll be there f- until it's gone, probably. And yeah, so follow us on social media. Please keep in touch. Remember to like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And we'll be back next week for part two. And we're going to find out. Are we alone? Yes, we are. But and, and just quickly before we go, I just want to give a special thank you to Matthew Costa and Nathan Lawrence. And I want to also uh, give a shout out to our editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and uh, and our composer, Kevin Blumenfeld, and our intern, Amber Cohen. And that's it. Come back next week. All right. We'll be back. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.